When it comes to World War II, it's not all that hard to end up thinking of the Japanese kamikaze pilots who would dive bomb their planes into Allied ships. But the truth is quite a bit more complicated and tragic at the same time. By the last few years of World War II, things weren't going Japan's way. The Japanese military was wildly outmatched compared to the Allied forces. Their air force wasn't what it used to be, and they'd lost a lot of their skilled pilots over the course of the war. Combined with the higher quality training and funding given to American pilots, and the more powerful aircraft used by the Allied forces, Japan knew they couldn't keep up. It didn't take long for those disparities to rear their ugly head, and the Japanese military began losing more and more battles. Military leaders started increasing their recruitment, drafting university students into the war who had previously been exempt, but it wasn't enough. Discussions began around fall 1943 about new tactics, but when Japan couldn't stop the Allied forces' march across the Pacific in 1944, they had to do something. Enter the Special Attack Units. These were the units intended to carry out suicide missions, and it just showed how desperate the situation truly was. The Japanese military landed on one last effective defense against the Allies, which they would use through to the last stages of the war. The kamikaze pilots became one of the more recognizable units of the Japanese military, but their suicide tactic wasn't unique. Really, they were only one of the units under the umbrella of special attack forces. The military is talking about the suicide of the 100 million and encouraging all Japanese to embrace what was called the special attack spirit. There was a ground force in 1942 as a precursor to the special attack forces. They weren't exactly suicide missions, but were small groups sent out at night, meant to decimate enemy bases with hit-and-run tactics. At least some of the men were expected to survive, though the mentality was the same – maximum damage with the least resources. But there were other official special attack forces, including Kaiten, which were manned suicide torpedo missions. One man would be seated inside the torpedo and drive it into the side of an enemy ship, exploding on contact. In the same vein, there were also suicide crash boats and tiny submarines that served similar purposes. By the very end of the war, the desperation really cranked up, as did the suicide missions. Sometimes individual soldiers would put on scuba gear and hide just off the coast, armed with explosives on bamboo sticks, destroying ships that passed over them. Or there were their land counterparts, soldiers who strapped bombs to their bodies and hid in pits, blowing up tanks that rolled over them. The special attack forces were created to cause the most destructive effect with the lowest cost in terms of both materials and people. And so there were new vehicles designed just to service this end. The little suicide crash boats, meant to sink ships just off the coast, were made almost entirely of wood. Only one person navigated it and was made to run on an old Toyota motor. All of that extra space and money went toward loading the boat up with explosives. And when it came to the kamikaze pilots, they got specific planes called the Oka. These were basically little gliders with a bunch of explosives shoved into the nose. They were hooked onto the bottom of a larger plane, with parts made out of wood instead of metal. It didn't need to be strong after all. They weren't all that fast or even maneuverable. That said, not all of the planes were specially made for suicide missions. By the end of the war, desperation had gotten bad enough that any old planes were also being used. They were stripped of radio equipment and weapons and loaded with explosives. One of the myths surrounding the kamikaze pilots is that they were untrained and Japan just needed bodies to fly planes into ships. To be entirely fair, there is a little bit of truth behind it. The military began to pull kamikaze pilots from those who were only partially done with their training, and by 1945, they'd cut the second part of the aviation training course entirely. Compared to other tactics, suicide missions took relatively little instruction or experience. But they did get different, more practical training. 
they had to know how to deal with weird problems like gravity when they would be dropped off the bottom of another plane. That's not exactly a normal situation, and since they were dive bombing at other craft, they had to be able to deal with that sort of piloting. Even though Japan was deeply desperate for more manpower, it wasn't like they just forced people to become kamikaze pilots. There was even a sort of questionnaire so they had a choice. Except, did they really? So yes, there were actually questionnaires handed out regarding recruitment as a kamikaze pilot. That's true. Stories collected by The Guardian and national news from pilots trained for kamikaze missions refer to some similar circumstances. The questionnaire was a slip of paper with three options which were, I passionately wish to join, I wish to join, and I don't wish to join. Potential recruits were taken into a room and given five minutes to decide if they would volunteer, decline, or let their commander decide. Another story reported on by the BBC mentions that pilots were sometimes corralled into a big group and asked to volunteer. On the surface, it does sound democratic, and it did start that way, but later there was just the appearance of choice. The use of big groups peer pressured everyone into volunteering, and even when three choices were given, most of the men knew there was only one right answer. Even though volunteering to become a kamikaze pilot was a little less than democratic, that didn't mean that all of the men were unwilling. A number of them were actually eager. The Guardian talked to Hisao Horiyama, who felt Emperor Hirohito was personally calling him to join the kamikaze effort. At one point, the Emperor personally visited his unit. From then on, he felt like he had no choice but to die for him. Most of the kamikaze pilots were young, 17 or 18 years old, and they wanted to make a name for themselves as teenagers do. That was just compounded with the competitive nature of the military. Volunteering to be a kamikaze pilot not only gave them posthumous honors, but also let them feel recognized, to feel like they'd somehow left all their peers in the dust. There's been a tendency to paint the kamikaze pilots as hyper-patriotic and reckless, willing to die without a second thought. But the truth is a lot darker. A majority of the pilots didn't want to die. Kamikaze survivor Takehiko Aina told The Guardian, he remembered everyone congratulating each other and then telling himself that he'd been chosen for this, but he realized that there was nothing to celebrate, and he was just scared. A lot of them were. Keiichi Kurahara has a similar tale. He was only 17 when he felt like his fate had been sealed. He didn't feel any of that patriotic fervor. He could only think of his mother and sister, who he was sending money to. He wasn't ready to die and leave them alone. Both men were glad they didn't have to. Kuahara's engines malfunctioned, and he felt fear turn to relief when he had to return. And Aina recalled feeling glad that the war was over. It was a chance to look forward and rebuild instead. All of the kamikaze pilots had to come face to face with an almost certain truth. They were going to die. Some were willing, some weren't, and some only did it for each other so that their friends might not have to make the sacrifice. Their last few days and hours were fittingly somber. There was no pomp and circumstance, no ceremony, no ritual. What they did was really just up to the pilots. Some would bury locks of their hair behind shrines, others would drink their anxieties and fears away. Sometimes, they got a few days vacation to go back home and see their families one last time. Then, on the day of the mission, their last few minutes were spent aimed at an enemy craft, with the instruction to send one last Morse code message, just a long, uninterrupted signal. And on the receiving end, if that long signal just ended with sudden silence, then the mission was successful. The post-war period wasn't kind to the pilots. The Allies occupied Japan for about seven years following the end of the war. While there, they had it in mind to ruin the reputation of the kamikaze pilots. They wanted to paint them as insane fanatics 
too reckless for their own good. The new government really wanted to push that, and eventually, the public treated them with indifference at best, or contempt at worst. Suddenly, it was hard for them to find jobs or even apply to schools. Also a stigma around the pilots called the Special Attack Syndrome emerged. This implied that they couldn't return to normal lives because they'd been obsessed with dying with honor and couldn't find a new purpose. Sadly though, those assumptions haven't really gone away. Some younger generations in Japan see them as idiotic, and the perspectives from other countries like America are even worse. The view that they were suicidal fanatics who loved death is still around. The word kamikaze is now used as slang for reckless and insane. In the post-war period in Japan, the kamikaze pilots were already dealing with some level of antagonism. In much more recent times, they've been compared to terrorists, especially in the direct aftermath of the September 11th attack on the World Trade Center. And that's not just some lazy speculation. A news release from Stanford specifically described the attacks as something between a kamikaze aircraft on one hand and a hijacked aircraft on the other. But there are really important differences to note. Terrorists tend to go after civilian targets. The kamikaze pilots and all the special attack forces were only sent after military targets. The BBC also includes the fact that the pilots only did what they had to because it was a war. They really had little choice. During the war, Japanese nationalism saw to it that the kamikaze pilots were seen widely as heroes. The Air Force had once been the place for rejects from the Imperial Naval Academy. But suddenly it became a viable and respected career. Advertising shot through the roof too, with posters saying to move forward 100 million, you are fireballs. It was all a ploy so that the public would look up to the kamikaze pilots. After the war, that sentiment completely fell apart. But in the decades after, it came back. As early as 1952, nationalists wanted to rewrite the antagonistic narrative the Allies had left. The pilots' actions weren't shameful and weren't a crime by any means. They pushed this view through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s to little resistance, and the pilots became seen as heroes again. And that's largely been the case in Japan through to this day. Kamikaze Images says that the Japanese people will often remember the pilots with tears in their eyes. They weren't nameless, faceless masses, but individual people, a lot of them really young and well-educated. Above everything else, though, the story of the kamikaze pilots is a tragic one. Documents and pictures have been collected in the years since the war in memory of the pilots who gave their lives and they speak for themselves. A lot of the pilots were university students. Their last writings show how they loved learning and delved into philosophical thoughts. They came to see texts in a new light as they were facing death. Another photo shows a group of young pilots all standing together and smiling, the pilot in the middle cuddling a small puppy. Even with death at the door, they managed to look cheerful. National News has a couple of other letters, too, addressed to loved ones of the pilots. One pilot wrote about the way the rain fell and the soft sound of the radio. He was able to record these thoughts because the rain had delayed his mission. Another pilot wrote to his parents, apologizing for not being the best son. He said he would die with a smile on his face and wait for them on the other side. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about the most fascinating topics are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.